Hey everyone, this episode is brought to you by River, the place that I personally go to securely invest in Bitcoin with confidence and with zero fees. What the Federal Reserve would have to do to stop Michael Saylor would be to raise interest rates to be greater than the expected value that, you know, we think Bitcoin's going to appreciate by. And so if we look at Bitcoin's, you know, the Kager, right, what are the returns for Bitcoin? let's say conservatively like 30%, 50%, right? So they would have to raise interest rates to be greater than 30 to 50% in order to stop Michael Saylor. That would destroy the financial system, right? The entire fiat system would collapse if they raised interest rates to 30 to 50%. All right, so uh, I've actually have not been paying too much attention to this. I've seen some of the articles where obviously talking about everything happening with uh, the U.S. government reaching out and causing the miners to start reporting their energy consumption and information and all of this stuff. Um, where where should we start with all of this? Yeah, I, I think usually we start with 1971 of, uh, you know, that's when we went off the gold standard. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that was an inflationary period in American history and that inflation included the price of energy. Right. And that was, um, compounded by the 1973 oil, uh, crisis that, um, it's also very timely given world events, but in any case, um, what, what transpired with the price increases was price controls. And then when you get price controls, then you get shortages. Uh, and then when you have shortages, uh, they want to ration and to ration, they need data. They need to know who's consuming, uh, what energy. And so that really is what led to the creation of the Department of Energy, or as it, it's known today. Um, and that's where we could start. Um, now, since then, uh, the you know, we've had the invention of Bitcoin uh, and this is where we can also talk about Elizabeth Warren's career, uh, Senator Warren from Massachusetts. Um, something that I find interesting about her background is that uh, she used to be a Republican uh, and she oh, used really? to have, yeah, I didn't more that. of a free market take. Uh, she, she had a change of heart at some point or Maybe she's a double agent. I don't know. When did um, that happen? What, like when? Uh, when did she flip from Republican to Democrat? I didn't know this. I don't really pay um, attention to these politicians like at all. So this is this is interesting it, to me. Yeah, um, I, I I think that um, her academic work led her to um, kind of see some let's call them uh, market failures or perceive some market failures, uh, and that uh, you know she felt like government could do better. Um, and that might have sent her down a trajectory of, uh, you know, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau uh, type thinking. Um, and, I, you know, I I take it uh, that she genuinely has had a kind of a change of views. But I also find it fascinating that she is somewhat flexible about uh, her own perspectives on topics anytime that they intersect with Bitcoin. So, for example, um, she's never really been a bulldog law and order type when it comes to any subject. Uh, she's never written about anti-money laundering uh, as an academic or uh, I've, I've searched, you know, kind of her, her records. And um, but once Bitcoin came along, suddenly she was like an expert on anti-money laundering and uh, was uh, very adamant about uh, bringing Bitcoin within the um, framework that exists for the fiat system. Um, and is, likewise, is she, the, is she the main driver? So it, again, like zooming out uh, this and, and what's the official name of the order? Is there like, yeah, really it's kind of uh, it was the macro. Yeah. So um, the Energy Information Agency is a part of the Department of Energy. And so they sent out a survey, a uh, mandatory survey uh, in January that uh, was essentially a, a form uh, that you have to uh, fill out as a... Um, now, there were lots of issues with this form, including kind of definitional issues. So, you know, they call it cryptocurrency mining. Um, 
personally, I I uh, I reject the terminology of cryptocurrency. So you know, I'm like, well, this doesn't apply to Bitcoin <laughs> because uh, you know it's Bitcoin, not crypto. Um, but uh, the um, the 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 form that was sent out, it's actually rather similar to uh, other forms that the EIA sends out to, like for example, a power generator uh, mm -hmm. that is uh, you know on the grid. And I, I'd say that first of all. In principle, Bitcoin, I, I think that if you're connecting to the grid and that you are an industrial scale uh, participant on the grid, then it is reasonable that folks are going to ask you for information. Um, we can have lots of philosophical debates about it, but um, I think as a practical matter, uh, it's, it's reasonable. Um, the problem was really that uh, the form that they proposed mm -hmm. was very lopsided of let's only ask one major question, which is how much electricity are you consuming? They didn't really ask about when are you consuming it? And that's critical for discussing the topic of is Bitcoin mining uh, good or bad for the grid? Uh, because it really depends on when is Bitcoin mining consuming electricity? Um, mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. the grid, ultimately, the grid is not uh, a uniform homogenous entity uh, mm -hmm. that is always in one particular stable uh, state. Uh, the grid is always uh, changing in Texas in particular. Um, it has transformed kind of at every level of uh, granularity, whether you're looking at it year to year, um, you know, massive growth in solar, wind and batteries in Texas. Uh, so I think that Elizabeth Warren should be congratulating uh, the state of Texas over the growth of renewables. Um, you know, largely driven by production tax credits in the federal tax code uh, and just the natural abundance of wind and sun in Texas. Um, but it's also changing on a hour by hour, minute by minute, second by second level of depending on how hot it is outside, people will turn on their AC or if it's really cold, they'll turn on uh, their uh, furnace or their their electric heaters. Um, and and then, of course, on the renewable side, they're they're in intermittent generation. So uh, mm -hmm. sometimes the wind is not blowing and it's nighttime. Uh, but in Texas, it can still be 110 degrees outside uh, in the evening in the summer at 9 p.m. And so people still have their AC on, uh, but there's no way to produce electricity in that uh, scenario unless you have uh, batteries. But batteries are very expensive. Um, and what has really picked up the slack in Texas is a combination of natural gas speaker plants and flexible loads like Bitcoin miners who are able to turn off uh, to offset kind of the, the lack of wind or solar generation. Um, so in order to have kind of that fulsome picture of how Bitcoin mining integrates with the grid, you would have to ask for some pretty granular uh, data or at least uh, maybe some questions about, um, you know, when you're consuming electricity, do you respond to prices, for example? You know, mm -hmm, kind of mm -hmm. just, you could ask you price general questions like, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, they, they didn't ask uh, those kinds of questions. Instead, um, they asked for the total consumption and then they asked for really granular data about how many Bitcoin mining rigs you have, uh, what specific model they are, you know, what efficiency they have. And um, those are questions where uh, it seemed to me that really it's a combination of they want to ask the really straightforward question when it comes to evaluating the cost. Uh, mm -hmm. But then when it comes to the benefit, they're not really going to ask pointed questions about what are the benefits of mining on the grid. Yeah. But bigger picture, I think that the the problem with the survey was that they didn't ask for any feedback from the public. Uh, before sending it out. Uh, mm. And that is, that is a is that mandatory? That's it uh, it, it, that is required by the Paperwork Reduction Act uh, passed mm. in 1980. Uh, and so um, what they did instead was they declared a federal emergency uh, that if they waited a month for public feedback on this survey, that there there is a reasonable likelihood of public harm, um, which to us. Come on. Yeah, it, it was kind of an absurd uh, violation of uh, of law, right? That they were uh, they'd gone rogue. Uh, 
uh, and that they were uh, putting out a form illegally and that um, there needed to, to be kind of a change of pace here because uh, we, as a, as a nation, uh, we can't operate that way. Um, but especially, I think, as an industry that um, it, it reflected not physical reality or science. It really reflected the political motivation yeah. of Elizabeth Warren. And we're going to see that here in this clip. Yeah. So uh, for people that are just listening here, uh, I got about a five minute and 30 second clip. This is from uh, when was this? this was 10 months ago that this clip uh, hit YouTube, at least. So kind of to give you an idea, when did you say that the that the survey actually went out? Was it the start of 2024, Pierre? That's right. In January. Yeah. End of January. So this was this was about six months, would you say, uh, prior to the survey actually hitting? And uh, this this is a pretty incredible clip. So here here you go. I'm going to play it for everybody. Now, as you know, Bitcoin mining involves companies using powerful computers to verify transactions to win a Bitcoin reward. You may remember that at this same hearing a year ago, I asked you about the immense energy consumption of Bitcoin mining. Since then, the issue has aroused more public concern. A recent New York Times investigation found that just 34 Bitcoin mines in the U.S. are using as much electricity as 3 million households. That is the equivalent of the entire state of Arizona or the entire state of Tennessee. You know, that is a lot of energy, and most of it is dirty. Fully 85% of this power comes from coal or natural gas plants. That causes as much carbon pollution as three and a half million gasoline-powered cars. So for every one new electric vehicle sold in the U.S. last year, these Bitcoin miners did the climate equivalent of putting four additional gasoline-powered cars right back on the road. Now, I should note that my own investigation shows there are more mines than just the 34 that the New York Times analyzed. So the problem is even worse than reported. Secretary Granholm, when you came before this committee last year, I asked you if the federal government knew how many crypto miners are operating in the United States and how much energy they're consuming. And you said that wasn't being tracked and that more data would be needed. So here we are a year later, is the Department of Energy formal, formally tracking crypto miners yet? Great. First of all, thank you so much for your leadership in this, because I do think that you have um, unearthed a massive uh, problem. And so we don't know how many miners there are. We don't know where they are. We, all, all of them, I mean, some of them you do, but some of them, you, many of them you don't. A lot of them are just underground. Some of them are small operators. So as you and I have discussed, we have uh, charged our uh, Energy Information Administration with figuring out how to mandate a reporting of these entities. Now, that's complicated, as you know, because they are, many of them are underground. And so, even so, the utilities may not know right. where the, the draw is coming from. So, so let's talk about that. Yeah. Uh, given that crypto mining undermines all of our other climate work, we can't afford to delay on this. There's a lot of urgency around this. So I want to talk for just a second about the authority you have to gather information on this. Let me ask, Secretary Granholm, do you have the authority to mandate that crypto miners disclose information about their energy consumption? We have the mandate authority. Good. So uh, in your response to a letter I sent you in February, you indicated that the Energy Information Administration will first need to develop a new survey program to begin collecting information from crypto miners. By when do you expect to field this survey and use it to gather data from crypto miners on a mandatory basis? Yeah, we are, we um, first of all are looking at creating the survey from um, a regular report that is an electricity gathering report that we have now asked to include crypto as part of it. That report from, the, from NREL will be completed by the end of this year. 
on which the Energy Information Administration can base its survey. So it's going to take some time for them to be able to craft the survey from the information that they receive from the NREL report, but know that that is happening, and we are um, pushing to accelerate the timelines okay, because so, it is. So by the end of this year, you will have a report on mandatory reporting, putting a... We'll have a... I want to make sure I know what yeah, we're Yeah, yeah, no, no. We'll have when. a report that will have gathered, not fully, but enough m information to be able to craft the framework for the survey. I can't take this anymore, Pierre. This is brutal. Uh, so there you go. So middle of 2023, they have this exchange. She's saying, get the data, then get the survey sent out immediately. This is, she didn't say the word emergency, but she did say urgent, urgent, urgent all through there. And then the, the reason why you're saying that they pumped out the, uh, um, uh, the survey without public notice is because they ran it under this emergency clause that gave them the authority to do it. Right. Uh, that's right. Okay. So you, so you guys take this to court. Uh, and was, who was, I know you work for riot, but was it the collective mining community that like all got together? What was the orchestrating, uh, body that, that was used to, basically take this to court or was it just riot that took them to court uh no it, it was uh, texas blockchain council uh with okay. lee brancher's leadership he really uh was the tip of the spear on this uh and um immediately put together um a legal team to uh challenge this in federal court um because um you know first of all we'd rather have a just a constructive working relationship with the Department of Energy with any regulators course, who are yeah. interested in our industry. Um, and the, we would have happily participated in a public notice and comment and, you know, submitted comments and provided feedback to the survey. Um, and, and I, I think that, you know, the, if they had not taken our feedback into account, then, um, perhaps we would have had to go to court anyway. Uh, but, uh, they, they kind of, I think that they kind of shot themselves in the foot here because in all of this urgency, in all of this emergency, um, by doing it this way, they actually delayed themselves because mm. the outcome of the lawsuit. Now the judge immediately saw right through what was going on, which is that you have Senator Elizabeth Warren, uh, bullying an executive branch agency that is supposed to be nonpartisan, by the way, the EIA mm -hmm. is supposed to just be like, you know, the military, right? They're supposed to not be in politics. They're supposed mm -hmm. to um, uh, be independent in, in some regards. Um, but uh, here she was really browbeating uh, the Secretary of Energy uh, into a really what's a niche topic. I mean, it sounded uh, completely scripted, like the whole back yeah. and forth sounded totally scripted, it sounded like they had already hashed out exactly who was going to say what, how they were going to say it, when they were going to say it, where they were going to say it. Like, I mean, I think anybody that listened to that, especially when you watch the clip and you see like their facial reactions is really obvious. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I think that um, if they had just done it the right way, they would be further ahead than they currently are. Um, but I think that they they saw an opportunity of, hey, maybe the Bitcoin miners won't push back on this. And maybe their thinking was that um, it doesn't look good to sue the government and to, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it, it kind of signals a lack of transparency if if you're not up on the topic, on the issue and deep in the weeds of the Administrative Procedure Act or the Paperwork Reduction Act. Um that you know it looks like we're we're resisting uh, transparency when really the opposite is true the bitcoin mining is the most transparent industry in the world uh thanks to the bitcoin blockchain right uh mm -hmm. and furthermore that um it's not that we don't want to provide this information uh it's actually more so that we want to provide additional information uh mm -hmm. that there's not enough context being put into this form to mm -hmm. correctly explain the role that bitcoin mining has on the grid uh, instead, it's an oversimplification because at the end of the day, uh, Senator Warren's only goal here is to have a stepping stone towards banning Bitcoin mining. 
Uh, she's trying to find some kind of leverage, some kind of ammo uh, to use against Bitcoin miners uh, by weaponizing a, a federal agency, or at the very least to harass the Bitcoin miners uh, by imposing this, this requirement on them. Because really what, what they could do, and I think would make a lot more sense, is that you just add Bitcoin mining as a category to an existing survey, just as Secretary Granholm was talking about that uh, there's other surveys out there uh, that, w so you don't necessarily need to send it to a Bitcoin miner. They could yeah. just send it to ERCOT and say, hey, how many Bitcoin miners do you have? ERCOT would say, well, we have 2.5 gigawatts. Like we know exactly that number because we're the grid operator. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this also touches on the emergency point, which is that ERCOT already has all this data. Uh, so if there's a grid emergency, um, it's a, you know, the EIA doesn't, they, they don't have a role in that, uh, at, at all. They, you know, they, so it, it, furthermore, ERCOT would not connect Bitcoin miners to the grid if there was a risk of public harm. Uh, it would be negligence for them to do that. Their whole mandate is reliability. Not to mention a grid emergency would happen where there's no Bitcoin miners. Well, yeah, I mean, that 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 to me is the other incredible point. And that with all this talk of renewables, Bitcoin miners are giving more revenue to renewables than Elizabeth Warren, certainly. Right. I mean, I, I can't imagine she's given more than uh, 100 dollars to renewables, while Bitcoin miners have given millions and millions of dollars uh, to wind and solar and battery. Um, but, you know, I think that it's just part of her overall attack on Bitcoin uh, that she's trying to find every angle of, oh, Hamas is using Bitcoin. I mean, look, she if she's going to pick a side well, on that conflict, she's probably more pro Hamas than anything else. So uh, that, you know, that didn't really uh, get any traction because she also got debunked uh, on on that point. Um, but every thread that she can find, she's going to pull on. Because ultimately what she wants, my perception of it, based on her statements, is mm -hmm. that she wants a CBDC. She wants her, um, and it's interesting, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is technically funded by the Federal Reserve. Uh, so I think that she wants her and her um, her, her entourage, uh, you know, her, her mentees uh, to uh, be leading the way in terms of micromanaging America's finances. Didn't, uh, so she had a ton of people in, this is kind of going back to the FinCEN, uh, thing that I was working on. Um, she had, I can't even remember the number, but she had a lot of senators and a lot of representatives co-sign the document that she sent off to the white house that had that wall street journal article that was completely debunked by uh coin analysis. I want to, I, I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but she was saying it was a hundred million plus dollars going uh, dollars and buying power through crypto going to Hamas. And it ended up being like 450 K or some something in that ballpark. So it was just dramatically off and different. But, um, I, I wonder if all of those cohorts that co-signed that FinCEN document that, uh, that she sent over to the white house, um, if they're, if they, if she lost some of them because of all of the 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 proof that she was using being debunked like heavily debunked uh wall street journal went back on their report and who they were referencing and all of that Did, have, have we seen any of that or does it seem like they're just still kind of all in the same camp that had co-signed the fincen piece and i'm assuming they're all the same actors that are on board for this uh eia uh report and survey that that went out uh, perhaps. I mean, I think that most of them uh, just have so many issues uh, going on at the same time that, you know, with mm. the government having its finger in every pie uh, that uh, for them, co-signing a letter is just, you know, a uh, it takes oh, less yeah. than, you know, a couple minutes of whatever. Yeah. OK, sure. Uh, and I think that the 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 the, the problem, though, is that she is she is spending political capital. Mm. And that um, there's only so much political capital that she can spend. Right. Uh, yeah. And the 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 consequences might be felt at the ballot box that if she continues on in this direction uh, and Bitcoin continues to increase in adoption, 
as it has been over the past couple of months. Yeah. Uh, she's going to have electoral consequences and the people who affiliate with her are as well. Um, so not to, I think not to mention Wall Street, I think, is really uh, opening up in kind of like, hey, uh, maybe this Bitcoin thing ain't so bad after the performance of the ETF. And they're seeing the fees that they're starting to collect off these ETFs. It, it's almost like they're like leaning into it. And I would think that she would wake up really fast in that uh, who's going to fund her if she continues to go down this path. And it's kind of starting to work out for a whole lot of people that are involving themselves in it. It doesn't make I, any I sense. I think that's right. Yeah. Um, so uh, ultimately, I think that uh, she, she, she'll fail, um, but uh, we still have to uh, stand up to it. And, you know, yeah. this story to me has really highlighted why it makes sense to be mining Bitcoin in the United States. Um, it's because we have a great system of government, right, of checks and balances uh, mm. and the separate branches of government that uh, and I got to applaud the judiciary on this one because yeah. uh, this this was in a lot of other countries. You can't just go sue the government. Uh, mm. If you do, you might end up in, in jail. Right. They'll send you to yeah. Siberia or whatever it is. Um, so it, in this case, it was a big win. Um, How long did it but, take to get overturned, uh, Pierre? Like once you guys were like, hey, you can't do this. We're going to take this to court. How long did that process take? Days. days. Uh, yeah, it, it was very fast. Uh, and then the, and, the, what the judge ruled, is it temporary? Is it like, uh, like what was the actual ramifications and like what's changing? Yeah, so the, the first ruling was a temporary restraining order. And in that ruling, the judge was very clear that uh, he thought, you know, we were completely in the right here. Um, and, uh, you know, the, this judge is a really, I, I think he's a really balanced judge in the sense that uh, he's ruled on some issues that, um, you know, essentially cross partisan lines, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. he does things that upset Republicans. Sometimes he does things that upset Democrats. Um, and so it's not like he's a hyper partisan judge. Uh, he just wants the government to follow the law uh, that, you know, <laughs> that was his, his uh, contention here. Now, what ended up ap happening afterwards is that um, the, so we scheduled a hearing uh, for, for uh, Wednesday, a couple of weeks ago now, um, and, uh, I was all set to go, uh, you know, testify in Waco, uh, on, on behalf of Bitcoin mining. Um, and they canceled the hearing, uh, because, uh, they wanted to negotiate an agreement, a settlement, uh, to avoid, uh, moving forward here because they didn't really see a path to victory. Um, and so they, they, not only did they concede on every, uh, point that we asked for, um, i.e., uh, destroying the data that they had received uh, and re restarting the entire process from zero. Uh, they also uh, paid attorney's fees because it essentially, you know, wow. they created this problem uh, that was of their own doing. It's not like, um, you know, it, it, it would be one thing if it was kind of a gray area, uh, then maybe they would not have paid the attorney's fees. Uh, but when it's pretty egregious, uh, mm. They realize that they've kind of got to bury the hatchet and and and, and make peace. Um, now, maybe it's my own ego, but I also have to imagine that they probably didn't want to have me on the witness stand uh, talking about how great Bitcoin <laughs> mining is uh, in federal court. Uh, so that might have been an element there. You would have murdered it. Oh, my God. Yes, that's a great point. Because would, would you have been the guy that was sent up? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lee Bratcher and I uh, were uh, all suited up, ready to go. You guys uh, would have melted their faces. Oh, my God. It, it would have been fun. Um, so we were denied that opportunity, but uh, we were granted a victory. Yeah, it sounds like they got scared. Wow. So so what's the path forward now? So what comes next? So they they have to uh, open up uh, uh comment period. Uh, and I think that this is where it's really important for uh, everybody who uh, is a stakeholder to provide comments on uh, what they think is good about the survey and what they think can be improved about it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there is a threshold question of, is this useful data? Um, because uh, 
arguably it's not useful in the sense that the data already exists. Mm-hmm. Um, ERCOT already has it. Uh, the EIA already has it as well because the EIA already tracks consumption of electricity. They just they track it at residential, commercial, industrial. Those are kind okay. of the three categories. Yeah, and it would be bizarre to add a fourth category that is like a a subcategory of industrial, a sub subcategory because you're saying data centers, and then specifically within that, Bitcoin miners. Oh, we're going to carve that out into a special group. Um, there would have to be some kind of underlying justification for that that would not apply equally to any other industry. And when you look at every other industry, you could come up with reasons why, oh, the EIA needs to know about steel mills or, you know, they need to know about um, uh, check cashing places, right? Uh, How much electricity are they using uh, to uh, exploit the public? Um, So the, uh, the, the argument for why there needs to be a separate form, I think that that argument, they... They haven't really made it. I mean, they've made the argument for why there is an emergency and that fell flat. Uh, that immediately got debunked, uh, you know, in the legal filings. But basically their point was that uh, the Bitcoin price is going up. That's what they started with is <laughs> they, at the time they said Bitcoin's up 50 percent. Now it's more like 100 percent. Right. Um, and come on, the then the, the natural consequence of the Bitcoin price being up is that Bitcoin mining is going to grow. Um, And that's certainly the case with Riot. Uh, Riot is um, developing a one gigawatt facility in Corsicana. um, Mm -hmm. And we're going to be energizing that starting, uh, you know, in in the coming weeks, uh, we're going to be energizing Corsicana. And the other part of it, too, is that we're going to start, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. you don't get to one gigawatt overnight. Um, But we're going to be phasing that in and we're also upgrading mining rigs in Rockdale. So it is absolutely the case that with the Bitcoin price being up, we're going to be consuming more electricity. Um, But at the same time, we're going to continue to execute on the strategy that really every Bitcoin miner in ERCOT uh, does is responding to the price. That is that if the electricity price is high, uh, we turn off. If it's low, we stay on. Um, yeah. One of the things that she said in the video, she says that 85% of the energy being used is dirty energy. My understanding was that it has some of the highest, uh, what is it? The carbon credits, uh, that, that are produced out of like almost any, any energy consuming, uh, industry. Is that correct? What's, what, what is the actual talking point that, that you guys have? And what's the data for that? Yeah. So at this point, over 50 percent of the electricity in Texas comes from wind and solar. Um, And her argument is particularly egregious because she brings up the worst possible comparison, which is um, internal combustion engine cars, gas cars versus electric cars. And she makes not even the same category. It's not even the same category. Right. Right. And her argument is, oh, because of Bitcoin miners, um, the. Uh, carbon emissions that were reduced with electric vehicles are now increased with electric miners. And it's like, well, hold on. If, first of all, there's no internal combustion engine uh, for mining rigs, right? Like I I haven't seen one yet. Uh, But um, uh, if anybody wants to build that, I'm I'm sure Steve Barber would would say that, you know, that's what he's building. But um, the the, the point being there, though, is that uh, Bitcoin mining is already electrified. It's already, um, you know, decarbonized in the sense that it doesn't emit any CO2. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, to to her point about uh, increasing, um, you know, the the use of renewables, she and uh, frankly, the Biden administration as well have a very extreme position on Bitcoin mining, which is that even if you are using 100 percent renewable electricity, Mm -hmm. On your own land, with your Mm -hmm. own solar panels, with your Mm -hmm. own windmills, not touching the grid, not doing any, you know, um, that that's still not okay because that electricity should be going towards curing cancer. Right. Or, you know, or or something that they want you to point it to and not what you want to point it to. Right. Exactly. Uh, And so they 
that's a very extreme position. I mean, this is madness. This is madness. So if you go out and perform work there, she's saying, I know how to point it to what I want it to go to better than you do, even though you're the one generating it and producing it. That's right. And she's also overlooking the point that quite often, um, solar and wind in Texas are overproducing electricity. Yeah. The electricity price is negative. So yeah. it's not like there's any kind of shortage. Texas is the energy capital of the world. I mean, there's an abundance of energy here. Um, natural gas prices are at all time lows. Um, and so from every angle uh, now, I know that she she doesn't like natural gas, but um, that's, you know, neither here nor there, because as far as Texas is concerned, uh, oil and gas are here to stay. They're not, you know, being phased out, uh, contrary to what, um, what, what, what some ideologues might argue. And the, you know, the, the other part about natural gas is that, um, when we're in those situations where we don't have any wind or sun, uh, and we do need capacity, uh, from natural gas power plants, um, well, if those natural gas power plants are not earning any revenue, they won't be there when we need them. Uh, they will shut down or they will leave the state and uh, then we won't have any capacity when we need it. And this is something that is a recognized issue at the political level in Texas, where the Texas legislature, the House and the Senate and the governor signed a bill to increase the state subsidies for natural gas power plants so that we don't lose that capacity that we need in extreme circumstances. And so really what I would say is that the push towards subsidizing solar and wind to the detriment of every other power generation technology um, is actually potentially creating an emergency. I think that is creating a risk of public harm of a blackout where uh, we just don't have enough power generation for um, you know every situation that we find ourselves in. The weather is very uncertain. I think that's, um, you know, people look at uh, at least the sun is a little has a little more certainty. But even there, when we look at day to day, if there's some cloud coverage, well, suddenly uh, you've got 20, 30, 40 percent less sun uh, output. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, of course, when the sun sets, you're at zero. uh, The wind comes and goes very quickly. So I think that um, the if the conversation is very dogmatic about, uh, oh, we only want wind and solar, mm-hmm. then you have to go to residential consumers and explain to them that their power is going to be out 20% of the time. Uh, and that's probably not an acceptable view. Yeah. And Texas voters, they voted on a, a, on that bill. They, they, it actually went to referendum. And so they all, you know, it, it passed the referendum. And so, you know, it, to me, it's a question of, do we want taxpayers to have to subsidize natural gas in order to offset the subsidies from solar and wind? Or do we just increase overall demand in a flexible way uh, so that we're increasing the utilization of the grid uh, outside of peak hours? And then in peak hours, Bitcoin miners turn off and the system works. Um, so I think that she's really barking up the wrong tree. Um, and she, she, it, you know, this is it to me, the, the other astonishing part of this is that she's in the habit of sending letters. So she'll send letters on official Senate, you know, letterhead. And so she sent letters to riot. Um, mm. we got one letter from her. We got one letter from her counterpart in the house. Um, and they were asking for our energy or uh, electricity consumption data. We provided that data to her. And uh, never heard back from her, right? Because we also explained the benefits of Bitcoin and uh, how, you know, flexible loads function and curtailment and demand response. We never heard back uh, from her after sending that letter. Um, She also sent a letter to ERCOT and asking, hey, why is ERCOT paying the Bitcoin miners? And to his credit, the CEO of ERCOT personally responded to her letter. And he explained that, Bitcoin miners are really a small percentage of demand response and that demand response is good uh, and that we should want more demand response. And so um, there's not really any kind of problems here. Um, 
she never replied to that either. Mm -hmm. So she is very loud, but then doesn't listen to anyone who is explaining reality to her. And I think mm -hmm. that's that's problematic. I mean, so uh, ho hopefully she listens to this podcast. Well, I want to shift gears a little bit. I'm sure she's listening, by the way, here. I'm sure. Um, many years ago, I would say, what, 2014, 2013, you and Michael Goldstein wrote about the, this speculative attack. Do you, re do you remember writing this? What, what, do you remember what year you wrote this? Uh, yeah, I think it was 2014. Um, 14? okay. I, Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, so there was a paper that was written about Bitcoin and a speculative attack that I read that um, I felt like got the causal mechanism wrong. And so I essentially wrote my version of it that I felt like was would be more predictive and accurate of how it would work. Um, and uh, that so, yeah, that was the initial impetus um, for, 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 for writing that article. So the reason I bring this up is because we've been watching MicroStrategy implement this miraculous uh, treasury with their common stock uh, riding at a higher price per share than what the treasury per share is. And as they're doing this, uh, Michael's just issuing more common stock, which you think would be dilutive. And then buying Bitcoin with the proceeds of, of doing this. And what we, what we're finding is that he's ending up with more Bitcoin per share by impl implementing this approach. And so I think, uh, you wrote about it more from like a central bank kind of standpoint, but, um, now that we see a company that has been implementing it pretty heavily, um, what are, what are some of your thoughts? And I, and I also want to throw out one other, uh, really interesting point. Um, recently he did, uh, when he first started doing this, he was not doing it as a common to cash to Bitcoin type maneuver. He did it with convertible debt. He took that. Uh, the, the funding, the, the cash that he raised from the convertible debt, and then he bought Bitcoin with it. And it was, that was the play, but then he slowly migrated it over to this common sh share issuance to Bitcoin play. And what I find interesting about the, 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 uh, convertible debt piece that I didn't know. And I think many others until just recently, I started thinking about this and seeing this, that. Because he's tapping into the fixed income market, he's creating this enormous amount of derivative interest on top of not only the, the fixed income, but because of the way that they're covering themselves in these, in these markets, they're also uh, owning a lot of common stock, which is creating a ton, massive amount of volume and liquidity on the common stock, which then makes this even easier for him to implement uh, by going and issue more common stock and, and buying uh, Bitcoin with it. So it's, it's like a PhD in, uh, in financial engineering and uh, maneuvering where you're issuing stock and it's not dilutive and it's actually like anti-dilutive, but you were talking about this for years. I'm trying, I'm really curious your thoughts on everything that he's doing right now. Cause it's just miraculous. I, I do find it fascinating. So, um, despite updating the, uh, the, the, the causal mechanism, uh, I still kind of got it wrong in the sense that I didn't realize there would be like a giga genius, like a sailor to come along because traditionally the way that, um, speculative attacks are thought of, and this is a term coined by our good friend, Paul Krugman. Uh, he, um, and uh, you know, people say, hey, a speculative attack sounds really negative. It's like, yeah. yeah, because Paul Krugman came up with it. I mean, just like Vitalik came up with Bitcoin maximalist, right? Like our our haters are ultimately the ones who are going to come up with the best, uh, uh, you know, things that we can appropriate. Bitcoin psychopaths. Like, yeah. ADIQ. Yeah. yeah. Bitcoin psychopaths. I, I use that one all the time. Plebs. Um, so with a traditional speculative attack, what happens is that um, the speculator borrows the uh, weak local currency and um, then sells it for a stronger currency. And so they're essentially uh, short selling uh, the, the weak currency. Um, 
Now, what makes this a really, um, let's call it like a positive feedback loop, um, although central bankers would probably consider it to be a negative feedback loop, uh, is that when they borrow that weak local currency, if they are borrowing it from the commercial banking system, they're actually creating more of the weak currency. And mm. so they are increasing the supply of the weak currency and then driving mm. its value down. And um, it's and then they repay the loan by buying back the weak currency at a lower rate uh, and uh, having a nice profit from that. Um, and so the way that a central bank counteracts this is by raising interest rates so that it is more expensive to borrow the weak currency and that will strengthen that currency um, and undo the attack. Um, so what the Federal Reserve would have to do to stop Michael Saylor would be to raise interest rates such that, you know, if he's issuing a convertible bond, because uh, that's easier to think about than than stock, although the principle is the same because we're talking about cost of capital and money is fungible and all of that. Right. Um, but the idea being that um, it, they would have to raise interest rates to be greater than the expected value that, you know, we think Bitcoin's going to appreciate by. And so if we look at Bitcoin's, you know, the Kager, right, the um, what are the returns for Bitcoin? Um, well, they're at least let's let's say conservatively like 30 percent, 50 percent. Right. Uh, Those are the, that, that's the number I think it is. I think you're like between 30 to 50 percent annualized. So they would have to raise interest rates to be greater than 30 to 50 percent mm -hmm. in order to stop Michael Saylor. Mm. Now, that would destroy the financial system, right? The, the entire fiat system would collapse if they raised interest rates to 30 to 50 percent. Yeah. Um, They're not. And, even, yeah, they weren't even like raising them hardly at all. And they had to step in and backstop Silicon Valley Bank. I mean, yeah. The alternative they have is capital controls. And so uh, they have effectively implemented capital controls for the commercial banking system by saying that the banks cannot hold Bitcoin, right? The, the, the banks cannot participate by uh, lending dollars against Bitcoin, mm -hmm. uh, you know, collateralized lending or anything like that. Um, but, so, now there's, but now they're trying to overturn that. I'm seeing movement that the banks are coming together. What do you know about that, Pierre? Yeah, uh, uh, Saab 121. I mean, I, I think that um, the whole th idea around reserve requirements and Basel III and all this stuff uh, is just completely ludicrous uh, because... Uh, the banking system is already insolvent. So it's, you know, it's really uh, Bitcoin's their best hope uh, for <laughs> getting out of insolvency. Um, Do you it, think they're going to get it overturned? Do you think that they're going to uh, allow to them? Yeah. I, I do because, um, you know, the what the Fed would have to do in order to tighten things up would be to apply the same rules, not just to banks, but to everyone. Otherwise, right there, it just creates regulatory arbitrage, which Michael Saylor is effectively using, right? Which is that MicroStrategy does not have capital controls. Mm -hmm. They can put Bitcoin on their balance sheet um, and they can go out in the bond market and raise funds to buy more Bitcoin mm -hmm. uh, and issue more equity to buy more Bitcoin. So as long as there uh, are uh, sectors of the financial system that are not subject to the capital controls, then everybody in the banking system is kind of looking over the fence saying, hey, we'd like to participate in that. If you're not going to stop him, why are you stopping us? Uh, it's unfair. Uh, and they're right. Um, so I, I, it would be unpalatable for the government to apply capital controls to everyone. Maybe they'll try in, you know, in an emergency, uh, but I think a federal judge would uh, overturn it, uh, given that they can't get a, a survey out. <laughs> more emergencies um so uh when are we gonna start seeing some other companies do this i mean i've got my opinion on why we haven't to date i'm pretty sure it's probably the same reason you've got but surely surely they have to be waking up i mean if bitcoin let's just say bitcoin goes a hundred thousand and we're looking at michael's balance sheet i think it goes up by a billion every five thousand uh that the price of bitcoin moves so i mean we're talking billions upon billions that his company is going to move people have to start waking up to this this is this is absurd absurd what's taking place uh or is it happening in 2024 like what's what's your feeling what's your sentiment 
you know, um, I, I had the the same thought about our, it, uh, you know, we, we would have liked to have more uh, co-plaintiffs on our lawsuit against the federal government. It would have been nice to have more of uh, the big Bitcoin miners uh, on the lawsuit mm. with their names on it. Mm-hmm. Um, so Riot, you know, stuck its neck out just like MicroStrategy is doing um, mm-hmm. a- as a matter of leadership, right? Mm-hmm. That um, ultimately it does take courage to uh, do what we're doing. Um, uh, and uh, so I used to think that we would see more imitations of Michael Saylor, uh, you know, back in the previous cycle. Uh, mm-hmm. For that matter, uh, we did see Elon uh, dip his toes and then, you know, he uh, I, I don't know quite what happened there. But so uh, did you hear did you hear my conversation with him uh, when I was on spaces? With, no, with I Elon? missed that. Yeah. So um, I was on a spaces uh, with Kathy Wood when ARK uh, launched their ETF and Elon joined and Elon made the comment that uh he had to sell the the bitcoin out of tesla for working capital reasons okay that was the quote so yeah i've provided my opinion what's your as an as an accountant and and financier what does that translate that for the audience when when elon said that he had to sell his bitcoin at tesla he still had it he goes but i still have it at spacex but I had to sell it at Tesla for working capital reasons. So what does that mean? Uh, translate for us. Um, well, I mean, I think it needs, it means that he, he needs to work with uh, my wife, Morgan, a uh, financial planner, uh, because <laughs> he, he over, he overbought Bitcoin, right? There they, you go. Um, he, uh, given his circumstances, everybody has different yeah. circumstances. Um, so Michael Saylor's circumstances are different than, than Elon's. But- Pierre, this goes to this point. I I keep beating this drum, right? It's it it's a drum that you have to like continually say. Bitcoin flows to the net producers. You you can't accumulate and you can't continue to hold it if you're a net consumer. And so, like when we look at Tesla and we look at where he was at and like how much he could buy based on the free cash flows of the business, he bought too much. That's why he quote unquote had working capital concerns right it's just so obvious you cannot hold on to bitcoin unless you're actually making and producing value for society at the rate that you are accumulating it it's just so in your face simple stupid like i don't know i it's a pet peeve of mine but keep going i interrupted you one of the most common questions i get asked from family and friends is preston where do you personally buy your bitcoin from And the answer is really simple. I buy it on river.com. Not only can you easily buy Bitcoin with zero fees on recurring orders, you can have peace of mind knowing Bitcoin on River is held one-to-one in multi-sig cold storage, all while being fully licensed and regulated in the United States. Plus, their relationship managers are US-based and available by phone for you or your business. Additionally, River has built their own infrastructure from the ground up, which means they don't rely on third parties to function like other Bitcoin exchanges. River also just created a new feature not found anywhere else called River Link. It allows you to send Bitcoin over a text message to easily orange pill your family, pay a friend for dinner, or send a gift. There's a new standard for investing in Bitcoin, and River is setting it. Go to river.com slash fundamentals and get up to $100 free when you sign up and buy Bitcoin. That's river.com slash fundamentals. Oh, no, not at all. I mean, I, I think that, yeah, the same principle applies on a personal level, right? For folks yes. out there that, um, hey, if if you're struggling with cash flow, like don't go and buy Bitcoin. You'll have to sell it uh, mm-hmm. before you know it. And it might be at a loss, right? Uh, mm-hmm. So given Bitcoin's volatility, it's not a short-term get rich quick thing. Um, it is a long-term savings vehicle um, and it works really well as a long-term savings vehicle if you have the balance sheet to and and, and the, the income statement and the cash flow uh, mm-hmm. to support um, holding it for the long-term. And I think that this is something that Sailor has to be applauded on as well. All of his critics were saying that he's gonna get liquidated. He, he bought too much, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and they were they were not running the numbers because uh, when you ran the numbers, like 
Bitcoin had to go to some ridiculously low uh, dollar value for him to get liquidated. And it was pretty clear that, you know, he was going to weather um, the drawdowns, which can be like 90 percent in Bitcoin. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and so he did. And then same thing for Bukele in, in uh, El Salvador. Yes. All of the critics were saying, oh, look, he's he's in the red. He's got a loss. But that doesn't matter if you have the correct setup from a overall balance sheet perspective um, that, you know, as a sovereign, uh, the, you know, he, his credit was improving uh, and his underlying economy was improving. You know, right? The GDP is growing um, now. I, I know that the libertarians don't like to hear about, you know, tax revenue being a uh, cash flow. But um, from a government perspective, yes, that's what it is. Uh, and so it. Uh, from every level of corporate, sovereign, personal, um, all the same principles apply uh, because you can't print more Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And that's really, you know, and the volatility is the same for everyone. So it's interesting to me that the critics, um, they have not learned to be humble, right? Mm -hmm. They, uh, they th th during the bear market, they should realize that there have been bear markets before and that due to the fundamentals of Bitcoin, that it will recover. But I think, you know, obviously as critics, they don't think Bitcoin has any fundamentals. And so they do think it's going to zero, uh, which is uh, leads to, to some pretty disastrous uh, analysis of the players involved. Here, my last question for you. So you have experience working at a large uh, exchange, Bitcoin exchange. Uh, when you were over at Kraken, you have experience working at a mining company. And now we get these ETFs and uh, there's a lot of people coming up with theories and uh, like what OTC desks look like. Where are they getting all these coins from to even sell on the exchanges? Um, we have 10,000 Bitcoin a day getting soaked up just in the ETFs alone. And there's only 900 that are being mined in, in a day. So. Uh, help us just wrap our head around these numbers because these numbers sound crazy. The, the number of Bitcoin that are about to be mined are going to go down to 450 a day. Where are they getting these coins from? It seems that, uh, you know, the price has moved aggressively. Uh, I guess I'm saying I think the price still has uh, a lot of aggressive moves yet to come because of what I would suspect is just a, a massive amount of supply suffocation taking place. Yeah, I mean, the, the coins come out of cold storage, right? And so uh, Unchained has a great uh, visualization of HODL waves, which kind of looks at the uh, at the blockchain data to show that, um, you know, during the bear market, people sit on their hands, right? The, they don't move the coins and that they turn into the, the age. Uh, and then in the bull market, uh, they come out of cold storage and they come to market and they, they circulate um, at, a higher price, right? And that's what incentivizes them to to come out of cold storage. Um, so I think that uh, there's probably some folks out there that, and I, I saw recently that there was uh, somebody had done some uh, blockchain analysis showing that there there actually was a a whale that um, from very early days, uh, 2010, that uh, had sold a big chunk uh, at 60k. And so I think that psychologically. Maybe there's a lot of folks around this price that to them, they they bought at 60K uh, mm -hmm. not so long ago. And they're like, all right, I, I need to get out of this because they're exhausted, um, mm -hmm. which I, is it's unfortunate. But um, I, I, ho hopefully they uh, read the Bitcoin standard and uh, listen to your podcast and kind of strengthen their conviction. So, I mean, but yeah, the, I think that between the folks who missed the opportunity to sell in 2021 uh who who intended to for rebalancing reasons right mm -hmm. and this is what it comes down to in my mind is um hey look if you bought at one dollar uh it is probably a good idea to sell at sixty thousand dollars some percentage uh whether it's to give to your favorite charity or to put your nieces and nephews through college or to pay off your parents mortgage or to buy a Lambo, you know, there's lots of good and bad reasons to, or, or to just put some money like in a S and P 500 index fund, right. That you're just kind of just de-risking some percentage of your allocation.
because you want to rebalance and you want to sleep at night, right? You just don't, not everyone has the risk appetite to be 100% Bitcoin, uh, uh, you know, uh, through the cycles. Um, and some so I think sleep, that some of us sleep at night better in, in different uh, portfolio c constructions, though. That's yeah. right. Uh, yes. And so we have to respect that. And that's what creates a market. Um, because without that, yeah, the price would immediately go to a million dollars or whatever it took to get people to move their coins to exchanges yeah. to sell them. Um, and so in, in some ways, yeah, the, the price is what is going to cause the market to clear. Um, you think, you think and we've, yeah, where do you think this is going by the end of the year? Do you think we're going above six figures per Bitcoin? Um, I do. I do. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I think that, um, it's just math, right. As, yeah. as our friends say, uh, the, the, the reality is that there will be very big drawdowns, mm -hmm. um, throughout the bull market. Uh, so I'd really encourage folks to avoid leverage, you know, stay humble, stack sats, all the same principles apply. Um, but the, yes, we are in a bull market. Um, the catalysts are clear. Uh, obviously, the ETFs are creating tremendous demand. Um, the supply is going to get, or from Bitcoin miners at least, not only is it going to get cut in half, arguably it's already gotten cut. We've seen a lot of miners announce that they are not selling as much Bitcoin as they have in the past. Um, and there's a very simple reason, which is that they don't need to sell as much Bitcoin in order to raise the same amount of dollars, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so just mechanically, they, they can more easily cover their OPEX and their CAPEX uh, that they've budgeted for uh, and sell fewer coins. So arguably, the halving has already happened. It's already priced in. Uh, but I think the other part is on dollar monetary policy, that it does seem like we're at the end of the tightening phase um, and that going forward, it's either going to be sideways or loosening uh, if, you know, depending on what the 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 data uh, comes in, um, but the, that that was a huge headwind in the previous cycle. Was that that inflation caused a uh, you know interest rates to go up? And uh, to his credit, Jeremy Powell was pretty aggressive about raising interest rates, and arguably that kind of dampened the Bitcoin bull market. Um, because as I was saying, with the speculative attacks, like it, it's. It, there's one solution for central banks. It's to raise interest rates. Um, if they're not raising interest rates, then I, th I do think that it creates tailwinds for Bitcoin. And we're easily going in the six figures um, this year. And then if we zoom out and look at, OK, 18 months after the halving, where are we? Um, maybe we are touching a million dollars because there's not anything stopping us from getting there. And there's lots of catalysts pushing us towards uh, that 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 price point. It really seems like the volatility is just going to continue to hang around from what we've seen in previous cycles. Uh, when I was out at the Bitcoin Atlantis uh, last week, um, I was asking uh, the panel uh, about their thoughts on the ETFs and like any advice for banks. Uh, we've had all these examples of people that were uh basically rehypothecating holdings and what how it ended for mount gox and all these others and uh michael had the comment that he thinks things are going to get really spicy with respect to the price action after we start to see derivatives stood up on top of the etfs which haven't even kicked into gear um which he's thinking maybe he's a year to a year and a half from now that some of that's going to get uh the approval and then the the construction on top of it and he didn't have too many concerns for wall street being able to kind of manage the risks of this he's he he actually implied on stage that uh he thinks that they're very well equipped to understand the risks and to position themselves and to deal with a lot of that as opposed to what we've seen in a lot of the shadow banking to date uh with bitcoin as it was growing up so he didn't seem to have too much concerns there he just thinks that what people were totally underestimating is like how much more fiat is basically getting plugged into the Bitcoin network once they put derivatives on top of it. He thinks it's, it's going to be crazy. Um, any thoughts on that particular idea? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that this is, um, this is an area where, uh, on one hand, 
the gold bug um, kind of conspiracy theorist folks are like, hey, anytime you have paper, you know, going around that that's going to decrease demand for the underlying. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's a cope on their part. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just that g gold has underperformed and they need something to hang their hat on. Um, I don't think they have I, an appreciation for the number of coins outstanding that are sitting in the hands of individuals that are never putting like any sizable amount of those coins back on where when you look at gold, it's it doesn't have that setup. It has it's sitting in government hands, a majority of the of the outstanding stock. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, the other part is that I do think derivatives actually create demand for spot because there's lots of trading strategies that rely on you actually holding the asset mm -hmm. um, while, you know, if you're writing a covered call, for example, you know, so mm -hmm. there's strategies where essentially you need to be capitalized with Bitcoin mm -hmm. uh, in order to be performing the strategy and, you know, uh, arbitraging whatever it is. And so I do think that is going to create demand. Now, plus uh, the counter argument. Pristine, plus it's just pristine uh, collateral. I mean, yeah. pristine, like, like we've never seen that can immediately settle. It can be sent, you know, anywhere in the world. It's, uh, 24 seven, uh, every day of the year. Like I, I, people just underestimate how powerful that is compared to anything else that's out there. And CME futures have been trading on Bitcoin for a while now. And, um, you know, nothing, nothing crazy has happened there that they survived the bear market. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, They've got pretty good volume on uh, Sammy Futures. So mm -hmm. um, I think that it's definitely going to be a, a further catalyst. Mm. Here, it's already been uh, over an hour here. Um, I really appreciate you coming on and talking about all the stuff that you're doing there in Texas with the mining, uh, raising awareness. If, if some of that conversation for the first half here has ticked you off, feel free to write. Uh, feel free to, uh, you know, put your representative on notice, especially if you're up in Massachusetts. And by the way, it looks like she has one heck of a candidate coming up against her that's going to give her a run. I'm seeing some of her tweets and it seems like she's quite concerned about this guy. What uh, real fast? What uh, do you know? Anything else? Does he have a shot at beating her up there? Yes. Yeah, so uh, John Deaton has has built quite a following, especially I mean, I know the Bitcoin people won't like this, but. Um, of litigating the XRP uh, issue uh, oh. as as a lawyer, um, mm -hmm. and and pushing back on the SEC. Now, whether you know it's a security or not, I personally I don't care. But um, the uh, the the legal arguments have certainly swung in the favor of Ripple and XRP uh, to the surprise of many. Um, and so John Deaton is a folk hero uh, within mm. the XRP community. Uh, and I think within the wider crypto community as well. Um, and so obviously he is um, the diametric opposite of Elizabeth Horn on this issue. Mm -hmm. And he also, I think, has um, stronger, um, a stronger way of talking about the challenges facing the working class uh, in the United States, where Elizabeth Horn kind of comes off as lecturing professor um, where he's more of man of the people, salt of the earth. Yeah. And no so doubt. I think he, he could have a good solid shot at, um, taking that seat away from her. And I think that that would send a very clear signal to the political class that, oh boy. um, if they want to, uh, pick a fight with, uh, Bitcoin and the crypto community, that it's just not going to end well. And Better that, up it's better to join them than to fight them. Yes. Yes. Pierre, uh, give people a handoff, uh, where they can learn more about you or riot or whatever you want to highlight for us. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, follow me on Twitter at Bitcoin Pierre. Uh, I also host a weekly podcast. Uh, so if you're not getting enough podcasts with Preston, uh, also subscribe to riots podcast block time. Um, and Preston's actually been on guests on, uh, block time as well. So, um, you know, I, I'm really excited about, uh, what, what riots up to, uh, in terms of expanding in Corsicana. So lots of great pictures. We just put out a monthly update. Um, and, uh, yeah, looking forward to what else comes in 2024. I can't believe it's already March. 
going to be an exciting year, man. Hang on. Hang on. <laughs> Buckle up. <laughs> thanks for having me on, Preston. Yeah, thanks for coming here. Inflation is going to pick back up. I think stock prices are going to pick back up. I think you will get talk of rate cuts going away and possibly even rate hikes. And I think the surprise will come around mid-year when the rate hikes don't come. Everyone that is like, okay, they're managing this thing for inflation. That will be the moment where they go, oh my God, they're managing this thing for deficit. They're managing this thing for treasury functioning. That's when you're going to see fireworks.